the School of Education and the Department of Higher Education, Dean David Roth and Department Chair and Professor Neil Fletchens respectful, respectively. I welcome you to the Department of Higher Education Speaker Series. It is an extra special honor for me to introduce our speaker to you tonight because our very prominent speaker, Professor John Thielen of the University of Kentucky was my doctoral chair and he is a longtime mentor. A wise dean that I know has told me that there are no coincidences. I have come to believe him. This morning, when I arrived to my office, I retrieved a voice message from last evening. When it was an 859 area code number, I thought it was Professor Thielen and his wife Sharon telling me that they had arrived. But no, it was a student caller from the University of Kentucky phone call seeking a gift renewal. <laughs> a coincidence? I think not. Clearly, it is not mere happenstance that when Professor Thielen was teaching me at the University of Kentucky that a future University of Mississippi doctoral graduate that I would later teach and work with as his chair, David Coleman Barnes, Jr., was a long snapper for the football Wildcats and a kinesiology major in the College of Education at UK. While a student, Coleman was nominated as an academic All-American and made the SEC honor roll. It is also not a coincidence that Coleman would later meet an Ole Miss alumna from Madison, Mississippi, UM master's student in higher education, Mary Beth Justice, an admissions counselor and director for the UM visit days. They met in my history of higher education course. Their love bloomed <laughs> as they poured over Professor Thielen's text. <laughs> first edition of the History of American Higher Education. They later married, and a gift from their family has supported the Higher Education Speaker Series. Something Professor Thielen taught me through his humble example is that it is a tremendous privilege to teach and work with students in higher education. He takes so much joy in his work. So his teaching has been a true gift that has come full circle. Just, if I, just as I have been privileged to know and work with Professor John Thielen, it has also been my privilege to have known and be a professor to Mary Beth and Coleman Barnes who have recently located with their two children, Caroline and William, to Morgantown, West Virginia, where Coleman serves as the Associate Athletics Director for the Mountaineers. Combined, Mary Beth and Coleman have over 30 years' experience as higher education professionals in support of students, including <coughs> student athletes. We are so proud of them and their many accomplishments as University of Mississippi Higher Education alumni. And we are so very appreciative of them and their generosity to our program for this special gift of Professor Thielen's visit to our students. In fact, Coleman, who also read Professor Thielen's Games College play, Gates College's play, Scandal and Reform in Intercollegiate Athletics, upon my recommendation, <laughs> reached out to me by email yesterday. He was so excited about our students having the opportunity to meet you. We are deeply 
gratified that Professor Thielen and his wife Sharon have joined us in Oxford tonight. Professor Thielen was a college student in the 60s, graduating from Brown in 1969. He then studied American history and history of education at the University of California, Berkeley, earning his master's degree in 1972, and later his doctoral degree as a Regents Fellow in 1973. This was almost, his, his graduation was almost one decade after the free speech movement emerged at Berkeley when students protested a ban on on-campus political activities, student leaders taking cues from the civil rights movement and those in opposition to the Vietnam War. Tonight, he will share more with you about his observations and historical insights of this oft characterized as a tumultuous decade. And I am confident that from reading his work and from tonight's talk, you will leave with a richer understanding of the larger landscape of higher education in the 1960s, far expanded from the typically more narrow focus on student activism that captures the popular imagination of the era. Three editions later of his widely read History of, Ameri of American Higher Education and the publication of his essential documents in the History of American Higher Education, uh, which students are required to read, is he is the pre preeminent scholar in higher education history today. As a historian, his record of books, peer-reviewed articles, scholarly essays, reviews, and editorials is extensive. He is a frequent contributor to Inside Higher Ed and The Chronicle, and something I appreciated as a Kentuckian and student, the Lexington Herald Leader. For our students, I want you to know that Professor Thielen has been the keynote at NASPA's uh, conference and that he is a former president of the Association for the Study of Higher Education, or ASH. He has been recognized with the Association's Outstanding Research Award. Among other accolades, Professor Thielen has been honored as a scholar and researcher by the National Education Association, the American Educational Research Association, Division J on Post-Secondary Education, and the Council for Advancement and Support of Education. He was honored with the Marquis Lifetime Achievement Board uh, by Who's Who Publications in 2017. Because we have so many students here this evening, I want you to also know that Professor Thielen has received the University of Kentucky Alumni Association's Great Teacher Award, the Provost Award for Teaching, and the Sturgill Award for Outstanding Faculty Contribution to Graduate Studies. To say he is a great teacher and mentor to graduate students who lovingly call him coach is an understatement. Simply put, you cannot attend an academic or professional conference in higher education or even hold a book club discussion in guidance annex without meeting a former graduate student that he has mentored or taught. He is an absolute delight, an absolutely delightful teacher in the classroom and legendary for his sense of humor. But more than all of this, he is a good person and a great colleague who teaches us the value of showing up to support each other as colleagues and scholars in the academy. Above all, it is his spirit of mentorship and collegiality that is truly an 
inspiration to those of us who have known him, and one that is so challenging to live up to. Thank you, Professor Thielen, for all that you've done for me and for so many other students. We warmly welcome you and Sharon to the University of Mississippi. response 
to the oldest campuses. Uh, we, we sometimes have throughout the day, including the book discussion group, uh, visiting various sites and buildings, talking with a number of uh, graduate students, alums, and staff, and faculty, is that uh, what comes across to me for all this is hospitality and heritage. And uh, to complete that alliteration of H's, is the hospitality and heritage are humble. It's uh, uh, just genuinely moving uh, to see the morale and camaraderie and cooperation and engagement that you foster. And because a beautiful campus, yes, is beautiful, but ultimately you are the uh, characters in the script that bring the campus to life, and so I thank you for that. So, let's go to college in the 60s. I did not choose this book cover. It was the, uh, a wonderful graphic called the Johns Hopkins University Press, and it, it captured and conveyed many messages or themes that I was trying to uh, bring out in my own narrative. But what's interesting is that the students are, are quite well dressed. Uh, and they are, I think they are concerned, they have placards, uh, they're demonstrating, but they also are polite and courteous. And that, that's an important theme that runs uh, throughout my account of this decade, in that there is such an understandable uh, attention to gravitate toward the most extreme images of, uh, it could be, for example, burning an ROTC building or unruly students, whatever. And what I would suggest, open to uh, reconsideration, uh, is that for the most part, students, if you looked at all colleges and universities across the United States, yes, there were very deep concerns and a number of very important issues. In the main, however, there was a, it was a, a very, I think, informed concern. Uh, it was uh, polite, uh, trying to play within the ground rules of civil behavior. And there's certainly going to be some important departures from that. But I thought that this photograph, which actually is, is taken uh, at the University of California, Berkeley, in April of 1967. So that's ostensibly a very, very radical campus, allegedly marked by a lot of uh, very severe disruption. You know, this is getting pretty late in the decade. So I pointed that even at the most active, uh, violent sites, we find uh, civil behavior uh, and I think informed uh, concern and dissent. In contrast to that cover, <clears throat> I selected uh, a number of photographs uh, that, that tend to be the most photogenic in terms of media coverage or whatever at the time, ranging from uh, the Harvard student strike uh, in 1969. By the way, that is the same stadium uh, that was central to the movie Love Story, in which Ryan O'Neill and Ali McGraw uh, make snow angels on the football field. It's, it's truly a multi-purpose. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we have students uh, at Columbia University and then at University of Wisconsin. This, this would be, I think, those indelible images that have tended to shape uh, the popular portrayal. And I do not discount those. I don't dismiss them. I would, however, like to balance and blend them with a range of other institutions and kinds of student conduct and behavior. Further example, here we have, for example, part of the, the Mississippi uh, contribution to the saga of uh, Jackson State. And then, of course, from May 1970, uh, the uh, student uh, demonstration at Kent State uh, in, in Ohio, uh, with the tragic uh, incidents of uh, National Guard's uh, troops uh, firing on students. One reason I think that the Kent State episode was so important is that Kent State was, and, and I, I've talked to some of you, uh, or some who grew up in Ohio, Kent State was not 
a, a rebellious campus. Was Watergate and Campus a first gen, what we would call first gen students? Their students, they were preparing to be public school teachers, accountants, nurses, uh, engineers. Uh, and so to me, the fact that student dissent and then the strong violent responses, uh, the fact that this took place uh, in uh, middle America, in the heartland, uh, in a region and an institution that did not have a heritage of reputation for such dissidents, I think that showed the extent and the far reaching uh, by the end of, uh, of the decade. Yes, of course. Uh, no uh, account and, and memory of the decade would be complete uh, without the inclusion of all this. But interesting is that, that this comes early uh, in 1962 uh, with racial segregation. But one reason I include these slides is that for me in my visit, it's not so much for me to tell, but I've learned a lot from listening, talking and listening to KD and other students or whatever. So uh, I look forward to learning more about the heritage and the aftermath and the response of the institution over time. Also, in, in my book, uh, I try to include the historical black colleges, which often are overlooked. We go to, well, either uh, Greensboro, North Carolina, or South Carolina State, uh, institutions that uh, do not have uh, the publicity or the resources uh, or uh, reputation of some of the more prestigious, glamorous campuses, but it's important that their students be included uh, in this program. Some of my own alma mater, uh, Brown University, which was a very, it was called the Quiet Campus. Uh, I, I don't think it belonged to Society of Friends or uh, it wasn't like Gaudi yet. Uh, but even, even at Brown, uh, African-American students uh, stayed for protest and walk out. Um, but I think it came very late, uh, like in 1969. Uh, I, I don't know how much of an impact that it made. And then uh, more from uh, Jackson State. So they give you the range, uh, and uh, geographically, institutionally, of uh, student demonstrations. At the same time, in going to college in the 60s, what I think is important is that colleges were the darling of American life. Americans right. like colleges. <coughs> what's, what's interesting is we obviously associate, for example, uh, big time college sports with being the primary uh, source of spotlight for our campuses. And, and understandably so, that's what that is after. What was interesting uh, that Hollywood uh, tried to uh, kind of cash in or extend the appeal of the campus beyond college sports, and one of the most successful popular shows during the early 60s uh, was College Bowl. And it, it, it used the, the rubric of like jump ball questions, they had halftime, they had a whistle, uh, all the elements of an athletic contest were transferred to an intellectual, academic, uh, question and answer, or something like Jeopardy, uh, but many years before, pitting the, as they would say, the varsity scholars from Princeton versus, in this case, uh, uh, from Georgetown. Now, what's interesting in the uh, slide that we had to have over here, an important break here, I'm going to make sure I get the name right. Um, this was the victorious team from Agnes Scott College. A very important landmark in that, first of all, this, uh, this was the most popular show on Saturday nights for, for about four or five years, nationwide. Agnes Scott College defeated Princeton. And the, the shock that went through the always modest Princeton Tigers, uh, that uh, a women's college from the South 
had the audacity to trash them.
during the decade of the 60s, we went from maybe having, let's say, roughly a third of high school graduates going on for some kind of advanced study. And I think that would, by the end of the decade, they would approach more like 50 to 60 percent, almost doubling a percentage of students who go on to some advanced study. At the same time, not only doubling the percentage, the number of high school graduates uh, doubled. Uh, much larger cohort. So you're getting these kind of four factors. And, and so, yes, students were admitted, but once arriving on campus, the treatment was, uh, am, I, am I making noise? Yeah. Yes, sir. Better? OK. Um, I'm still making noise, but I hope you see more. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> Grader said, 
I've been this far, but no further. Yeah. <laughs> 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 it was all harsh, uncaring. And there, there are legends, for example, that uh, uh, you know, like, like deans and administration and presidents and provosts, they would be uh, kind and generous to parents. But once parents had packed up and gone away, uh, usually there was a part where the dean of freshmen would assemble uh, here at your freshman class and say something like, shake hands with your fellow student on the right of you, on the right and the left of you, and depending on the severity of the students, say like, one out of three of you will be here for graduation, or two out of three of you. But it was, it was a very um, kind of mean-spirited, uh, fatalistic view. Or the other would be that uh, uh, a professor assigned to teach a large introductory class would, uh, in the opening lecture, uh, remind students, particularly, let us say, at, at large state universities, that, well, we may be required to enroll you, but there's nothing that says we have to keep you. And so there's an account of talking to uh, uh, an alumnus of the University of Illinois, uh, which is pretty remote, uh, and the dean of students would arrange for extra buses to come to campus on the day after midterms because they knew that the, the uh, number of students who would fail and want to get home uh, or not go home, probably maybe enlist in the military or whatever, but there was some kind of predictable harshness to student life that, that coexisted with the glamorization and popular appeal of, of going to college. One of the central figures who would be not only individually but also symbolic of a generation of university administrators uh, was Clark Kerr, uh, who would become president of the University of California and its eight campus system. And uh, at that time, Time Magazine was one of the largest circulation of weekly magazines, and there probably was no higher honor uh, as a public figure in American life than to have your picture uh, on the cover of Time Magazine. And if you, you can see, uh, at this flow of students, a uh, little wonder that the, the celebration from the academic leaders that they were describing the university today was a knowledge factory. And they weren't kidding. And they weren't apologetic. That was considered a good thing. That was the model. It was a way to handle business <coughs> expansion into mass or universal access to higher education. So uh, he was highly praised. Now, there is a, a, something of a Greek tragedy, even though he was a Quaker. He said, the saying that, that even very smart people say dumb things. I hope I'm not getting into that group. Uh, but what he did was, he would listen to students complaining about large classes, about new personality, uh, about uh, uh, overcrowded dormitories, whatever. Then he, he was giving this kind of like statewide televised address to the State Chamber of Commerce. And he said, oh, I'm just so weary of these predictable complaints by students. Uh, that these, you know, don't they realize how trite this is, that this is just a, a part of a late adolescence? And the students didn't think it was, was trite at all. And so as a university leader, I think it was symptomatic that you had a generation of administrators uh, who were rather oblivious, rather callous to what were essentially meaningful, legitimate concerns raised by students about the quality content of their educational experience. Now, what's interesting is that the students were not uh, President Kerr's only problem. Uh, there was uh, a newcomer to California state politics, politics named Ronald Reagan, and, and I was confident his career would end as being governor of California. But uh, the, what, in 1967, uh, <coughs> President Reagan, who was also in charge of the regents of the university, uh, made some important decisions. They then interviewed Clark Kerr as he came out of the meeting. He said, I came into the presidency of the university as I left it, fired with enthusiasm. And so here, 
within the span of about three or four years, the most popular celebrated university president is then uh, out of office in a political dispute. Uh, so it showed the volatility within the decade of, of how fortunes and careers, uh, how quickly they can change. And here's this picked at random, you know, the term knowledge factory. Uh, this is a, a chemistry building at a state university in there. Uh, I, I, I hope that that's clean data that's, that's going out of the smoke yeah. But, but the, the architecture of the period uh, really did convey a kind of industrial model. So the, the metaphor was, was grounded in, in some good, uh, solid examples. This is the University of California, Berkeley, 1964. Once again, what's interesting and would echo what I showed on the book cover is that, yes, there were massive demonstrations. And here the issue was uh, the right of student organizations to distribute leaflets and have speakers on a range of political uh, activities. And what's, what's interesting is that the students were wearing the, the coats and ties. They dressed in the but they, they would have neatly trimmed beards. Uh, it, was, it was not this irresponsible, roguish behavior. Also, what was interesting is that where university administrators misjudge students is they would pass an edict outlawing all tables of students' organizations, their card tables setting up to distribute uh, posters and literature. <coughs> their intent was to drive out kind of far left uh, political groups. What happened though, because they expelled all groups, it caused all these student groups that really disliked one another. So you had the young Republicans pulling together with uh, you know, the, the Marxists. Uh, and, and it brought the left and the right. So, so the administration's easy solution to one small problem actually was like throwing a lighter fluid on, on a barbecue. And so students became more united uh, in their uh, uh, kind of protest against uh, administration. Two examples of the extremes in, in college behavior. You may have read last week that Jane Fonda, at the age of 81, was involved in a political demonstration. Here she is in 1960. Uh, she played, uh, started a movie uh, called uh, Tall Story. The plot was at Custer College. She is a freshman, what was called the Katembe Coet. Tony Perkins, later famous in Psycho. Um, <laughs> Dave, if you laugh, <laughs> I've got your age. Um, he's a star basketball player, kind of a campus hero. Think of those registration tables that I showed you earlier. Well, Tony Perkins goes up and registers for whatever it is. And then Jane Fonda is behind him. And uh, the professor who's taking registration uh, said, uh, yes, miss, uh, what course would you like to take? And, and, and you know, this will be the voice of independent feminism. If you use that question, she says, this, I'll take what he's taking. And so it was this extended effort in the early 60s. Uh, when one of the sayings was, she didn't get her uh, BA, but she got her MRS. Was, was one of the standard uh, lines of, of that era. But a little bit later in the day, here's like University of Maryland, a relatively tranquil uh, state university. You start to see students uh, organizing, uh, it would be like having students in the Grove or whatever, for uh, a variety of political speakers or whatever. So you see this range within the decade of, of forms of students. Also, I mentioned earlier the like, college bowl, the importance of college sports. Here I would, would suggest uh, the extremes in this decade. On one side, we have Paul Bear Bryant um, at the University of Alabama after uh, a big victory. At the same time, the breakthrough, for example, for women, including women of color, we have Wilma Rudolph uh, winning one of uh, three gold medals uh, at the Rome Olympics. And what's interesting is that uh, Willow Rudolph competed for Tennessee State University.
University, a starkly black uh, institution in Nashville, woefully underfunded. And there were, there were no college teams. So they, they had a track club, and they would like pool their own money to <coughs> drive in a station wagon to uh, what were called amateur athletic meets. And yet, they, women would prevail, and she would end up winning multiple uh, gold medals. Uh, in England. But, but with no support from like your school system or your colleges or whatever. So you see it's like success and achievement in spite of uh, the, what the schools and colleges offer. Perry Wallace, the first African American basketball player in the Southeast Conference, 1967. Uh, he would go on to earn his law degree at Columbia, and then he taught for 40 years at George Washington University in, in Washington, D.C. He died two years ago. And I read his memoir account. He was, his family was from Nashville. Uh, he, he was an engineering major, an undergraduate, and playing SEC basketball. Quite a, quite a time demand for anyone. If you add to that the, the strain and pressure of being a pioneer, very, very lonely life. Here I have from my own University of Kentucky their tribute to uh, four African American players who uh, desegregated uh, University of Kentucky football. What's interesting is that part of the American War, and we talk about the level playing field and that, that sports is an activity that transcends uh, uh, non-merit factors, and if you have what it takes, sports is where you can excel. But that's not true. In fact, uh, particularly uh, throughout the South, uh, desegregation to enroll as a student went way ahead of participation in varsity athletics. Uh, a number of uh, influential coaches blocked the participation of African American students, so that, for example, uh, the University of Kentucky uh, would desegregate uh, in 1949, but would not have African American football players till 1969. You would not have an African American basketball player until I believe 1971. So, one thing to consider is that sports are not always on the vanguard of social reform and innovation. Sometimes they lag behind. Here we have the, uh, these two uh, scholar athletes were African Americans who became Rhodes Scholars. Uh, Albert Ellis, who uh, would teach at the University of Pennsylvania. And this is uh, Stan Sanders, who uh, went to Whittier College. I actually watched him play uh, in the early 60s. Uh, he was from uh, South Central Los Angeles, Jefferson High School. Uh, and was a uh, little all-American football player and javelin thrower and then a Rhodes Scholar. And he would go on to uh, Yale University Law School and then would be a very active, con attorney and political candidate in Los Angeles for about 30 or 40 years. But uh, the, the pioneering breakthrough of uh, these exemplary students, uh, it, was, it was against very, very great odds. And so they're, they're among my heroes uh, from, from the decade. I mentioned a little bit earlier of Wilma Rudolph and the Olympics track and field. What a difference a half century makes. Here we have the two foremost American, uh, actually world swimmers of their respective era. Great similarities. Both, as high school seniors, won multiple gold medals at the Olympics in swimming. Both went to Stanford University. Some of the differences stop there. Chris von Salza entered Stanford University in 1960 after having uh, won, I believe, three gold medals and one bronze in the uh, Women's Swimmer of the Year. She would never swim again competitively. There were no options for women at the college level. 
I mean, we think, for example, today of Stanford University as being a leader in women's varsity sports. Uh, but in 1916, when that was not the case, she would go on to be, uh, she would major uh, in Asian studies and would be uh, a pioneer in computer science. But in terms of competitive swimming, her career was over at the age of 18. In contrast, Katie Ledecky, uh, who uh, won uh, what, four, what, three gold medals in silver, I believe, uh, at the last Olympics, Katie enters Stanford University as a freshman after returning from the Olympics. She will swim competitively for Stanford on athletic grant aid, which would probably, with Stanford tuition, probably worth about $70,000 a year. And she will lead the Stanford women's team to I believe two NCAA championships. And she also was an outstanding student. She's working as a research assistant in the psychology department. And then she, she forfeited, she chose not to compete her senior year. And that is because she signed a $7 million endorsement contract for, I believe, with Speedo. And they have the brand wrong. Uh, but so here you have so many similarities, but look at the change that can take place uh, in, in a half century. Some of you may recall um, Ralph Nader as uh, a force in uh, American reform, uh, like on uh, about unsafe cars, and also as an independent party political candidate. This is his smarter sister. <laughs> this is Laura Nader, who was one of the first four women who tenured as professors at the University of California, Berkeley. There's an interesting account when she joins the Berkeley faculty uh, in, I think, 1962, early in our decade. And she's in the anthropology department. Uh, the faculty meetings were held at the faculty club. The faculty club was exclusively all male, by ordinance. She and her two colleagues who were women would get into the faculty by climbing in through this tiny bathroom window and sneaking into the back of, of the magnificent uh, meeting room. Uh, and so what it shows is even at a, a what's supposed to be a very progressive advanced university in the progressive state, uh, the, the uh, opportunities for women were not impossible, but they were very, very limited. And uh, she retired a few years ago, but would remain very active as a scholar, as an activist, uh, and as a, a conscience. And interesting enough is that the faculty club, which denied her entrance, has now been renamed in her honor. That's a monument I like. I want to continue my theme, because one of the major findings that came out of my research was, was the, the foothold and the uh, persistent effort that women made in becoming full citizens in the academic community, not only in global students, but active. Uh, and here we have uh, the first group of women uh, in, in 1969 at Princeton, and a book that just came out about a year and a half ago called Keep the Damn Women Out, with by Nancy Weiss Malcolm, who uh, was, I believe, the first tenured woman a professor at the history department and long time uh, academic dean. And she uh, took time to uh, review her files and go through and, and write this analysis that had long been needed to tell. But what's interesting is that the that, uh, place of women in the 60s, I feel, feel has been woefully a story that's undertold. And that if you look at a little bit later, around 1974-75, we're going to see an increasing uh, strand of women pressing for entrance into law school, med school, PhD programs. And that is a legacy of the 60s that I think stands uh, as significant and important as any other that, that you might uh, consider. One of the, the uh, 
innovations of higher education in the 60s was this problem that if you're admitting more students, how do you achieve some kind of humane scale even uh, as, as enrollments go up? This is an aerial view of the University of California at Santa Cruz that opened in 1965. And it, it personified what's called the cluster college movement. It was an idea of taking like Oxford and Cambridge Bay, the residential campus, and having smaller units. The, the slogan that the university advanced was with the cluster college, they wanted to make the university seem smaller as it grew larger. And the, the blueprint was that a residential college would meet a certain admission size. Or let's say you would have 300 students. And they would live and study. And many campuses today have like live and learn centers. It was kind of the idea. And then when you reach that limit, then you would construct another cluster. So then you get this like honeycomb that would, uh, no matter how large it grew, the total enrollment, each student had an affiliation of living and learning with a manageable uh, humane <coughs> And it coincided a lot, that structural change with in the late 60s toward the counterculture, uh, the summer of love or whatever. I, I, I guess that's a, a Santa Cruz version of organic chemistry. Uh, or maybe it's, I, I don't know. But what's interesting is that these athletes, they, they, they were behind on construction. They didn't have the ladder quadrant was finished. These were um, trailers. And the euphemism in their public relations material was encouraging students who know that you can be academic pioneers uh, and live in the covered wagons of the 20th century. So parents are paying this. My son and daughter, they're living in a trailer park. <laughs> So there were a lot of interesting experiments with, with uh, unexpected uh, side effects. <laughs> Here we have uh, Columbia University, uh, the uh, infamous student leader Mark Rudd, uh, whose mother uh, came from suburban New Jersey, my son, the revolutionary. Uh, and, and we have some early signs of the women's movement in the late 60s. And uh, at the University of Wisconsin of, of women trying to stake out their turf, their voice, uh, in this array of, of activism and events uh, on the university campus. Fine, faculty belatedly become so involved, but I see the students as the prime movers in this, but we would have what we call teachings. And so you would have uh, a panel of faculty speaking out on foreign policy or economics or whatever, and, and having the courage to take uh, a counterintuitive stand to what the uh, uh, established policy and views. And so you would find at some campuses that uh, attending teachings surpassed basketball attendance. So that's, that's no small uh, accomplishment. But it does show that there was a significant minority of faculty who I think did provide scholarship, teaching, and leadership uh, in, in joining uh, concern about a number of issues and causes. So that's my quick tour. I think we went 10 years in my hope, about 40 minutes. And so uh, I welcome your memoirs, recollections, or insights on going to college in the 60s. Thank you. Dr. Thielen, or as he said, comments, recollections. Uh, since it's being taped, um, after someone asks a question, we don't have a hand around mic, we may repeat it. Uh, but we'll open the floor to you all now. school in the early 70s, so just a touch after this, but this applies. The, the role of the war is absent 
beyond protest. But a lot of us went to college to avoid going to fight in the war. And that was kind of one of those rites of passages at the end that took the civility you talk about and starts to make it a little less civil. I just wonder if you had a, a talk about that a little bit. And so, John, the question was about uh, the role of the war, the Vietnam War, in making things less civil, and the fact that there were a lot of students that went to college uh, in relation to uh, maybe avoiding military service. So, the Vietnam War and, and the role was there. I think that uh, the primacy of opposition to the war and the world would, would, would really spike in the late 60s and then going a little bit in, into the 70s. So, I think the kind of latter part. Now, Here's my impression. If you looked at the composition of uh, the American military, which we enlisted, overwhelmingly from the class bias overwhelmingly lower middle class, lower income, or whatever. The, the impact on the campus, which let us say, is overwhelmingly in middle class institution. Still, there was a significant impact. One, the students who had concern about policy. But the other is that every young man had to register for the draft. So the odds were slim, but they were always present that if you messed up, you were going to be drafted. And what's interesting is, right, we think of students being thrown out of uh, school for something like burning a building. I've talked to many, many alums from the mid-60s, late 60s. They did something like, they accidentally broke a window at a party. You know, they were kind of petty pedestrian uh, misbehaviors. But if you were out, your draft board would know. And you, you really were uh, liable to be drafted. Another, another campus response was that uh, for many juniors and seniors, young men, uh, if they felt they were uh, likely to be drafted, see, when you're, you're drafted for an appendix, so you completed your bachelor's degree or dropped out of your graduate school, there were not many deferments for graduate or professional school. What they did was many uh, joined ROTC or went into officer training. So they, their, their estimate was they were going to be drafted. They were uh, eligible for that. So therefore, they better to go uh, as an officer. So in terms of uncivil behavior, I think that the, the we saw Kent State and other protests in the aftermath. So that one of my observations is that uh, many things that we call the 60s actually happened in the 70s. That there actually was this remnant of uh, demonstrations and student activism uh, made the counterculture that carried into the early 70s. But what was interesting is once, once the Vietnam War ended, a few years later, uh, college enrollment technically dropped substantially. So that they're particularly in community colleges. Because these have been available, legitimate ways for uh, young men to uh, defer or delay being eligible for the draft. Once, once the war ended, the, the, the use of the community colleges at that safety valve suddenly evaporated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. So in the book you talk a little bit about how in the 60s we see increased uh, educational opportunity and access. Um, by the end you're concluding that since the 60s we've seen opportunity continue to, to increase, but also an increase in inequality that higher education has contributed to. Can you comment a little bit on maybe the missed opportunities and sure, the, sure. those moments? Take one of the most volatile issues today is uh, student loan indebtedness. Bad as that is, go back in time and imagine, well, one way to resolve that is to not have student loans. And what's interesting is that uh, Pell Grants uh, were not available until 1972. Uh, there were uh, a few federal uh, loan programs from the 
and usually for like uh, uh, children of veterans or whatever. So what you have to imagine is a world where what we take for granted in terms of state and federal uh, student financial aid programs were, were either minuscule or non-existent. So at the same time, um, price was relatively low. Uh, many states had a zero or low tuition. But the difference was is that families, that, that just for most American families, there wasn't a lot of reservoir to dig into. So there was this paradox is college was reasonably affordable, but still lots of students could not go. As I mentioned, the, the higher education enrollment pretty much like doubled in the course of the decade. So I think the opportunity was increasing. I also think the opportunity was uneven. And it tended, you, you tended to be tracked into certain kinds of institutions. Uh, that, that every group, every denomination, every religious group uh, had their own colleges. And so there's a strong magnetism uh, that if you were a Methodist, you would go to a Methodist college. Uh, and within the state systems, it was a pretty uh, sophisticated tracking where your, your social economic elite would go to the flagship state university, uh, more of them would consider your first gen students that can go to the regional campus, and then, uh, then uh, what were then called junior colleges would be the safety valve that had pretty much open admission. So, so I think there were substantial gains, but they were very incomplete. And, um, once again, this paradox that, that the price of college was relatively modest, but there was very little in the way of financial aid available. I think it was interesting that you pointed out how these, these folks were dressed neat and all. And, and I've been interested in that everybody seems to to think that the, the protest movement were primarily hippies, that, that the out counterculture, but that there were so many divisions among SDS, uh, the different groups. Could you comment on the, uh, the uh, SNCC, uh, Students for non Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and that, that how they, they came together but they also were fractured. Yeah, and there, there were a number of like uh, SDS and other groups that, that were something like national initiative. They have steering committees, and they they would visit selected campuses. They would have a presence there. But I I was seen by my, my general observation that for uh, the, the heart of, of American college campuses was a fairly responsible, earnest. Um, student body, most of whom you know, want to be good citizens. They want to be civil, they want to be informed, they want to be engaged, they want reasonable job prospects. And um, that would remain at the core. Now, but, now, if you see some of the photos I had, that does break down around 1968 and 69. Um, it's interesting though, uh, there was uh, one uh, very informed active student at Harvard, named Stephen Kelvin. And he came from an old line activist family in New York City, kind of like from the 1930s. And he did this kind of informal check on some of the student activists at Harvard. And he always asked them, like, well, would they demonstrate enough to forfeit going on to Harvard Business School uh, or to Harvard Law School? And, and the answer was, by and large, a fairly pragmatic sounding group. And he kind of knew when to say when. Uh, and, and then also, uh, I think that is now, uh, prosperous African families have a number of fallbacks uh, that allow them to buffer their children from any youthful indiscretions or whatever. So uh, I, I tend to, to hold in abeyance that preoccupation with the truly violent, truly radical uh, extremes. I, they, they're, they're there, they're present. They're present. I don't know how lasting their influence was. Dr. Thielen, oops, there we go. Dr. Thielen, one of the, you mentioned one of the more important lasting changes was the emergence of the role of women 
in the academy and on campus. Um, also, you note in the book that another important development was the emergence of black studies, which then opened up the door for women's studies, Chicano studies, etc. Maybe you could talk a little bit about those changes and sort of where they came about, how they came about. Yeah. And I, I did some kind of calendar checking, and my impression is that those tended to emerge as courses and legitimate, you know, credit granting courses and departments and programs more in the 70s. Their, their roots and origins will come about in the late 60s, but it's pretty tough sledding. I think uh, a book called Black Studies made uh, uh, inroads uh, at a number of uh, universities and colleges. Women's study would lag behind. And the thing to keep in mind, for those of you who are veterans of, of curricular games, is that even a, a program or a proposal that had a lot of support, the ritual and dynamics of getting something approved, like for degree granting or for credit, under best of circumstances, it, it takes a long, long time. And so I don't, I, I think you see the roots planted there, the remnants, but, but the fruition is going to come a, a few years later. Probably have time for one or two more questions if we've got any. And while you're pondering that, think about that. One of the greatest sources of student concern in the 60s was lecturers that would go on too long. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, if you would join me in thanking Dr. Davis.